Thank you for joining us for a unique press conference we call Climate Matters TV. My name is Stuart Scott. We're coming to you from the Conference of Parties COP22 in Marrakesh. Here's my email address and given enough time we'll show it again at the end if you want to get in touch with me. Now today's show, the thorny question of population. And today's guests, or two-thirds of them, Raymond Ruyoka, Advocacy Officer with Reproductive Health Uganda, Nalini Singh, Program Manager of the Asian Pacific Re Research and Resource Center for Women in Malaysia, I think their acronym is ARO. And then Zerehun, Fitowek from Ethiopia. I, let's start out with the general question, and this is a rhetorical question. How do we avoid catastrophic climate change without addressing our booming population? Human numbers have gone from a few millions, perhaps, 100,000 years ago, to currently over 7 billion, and most of that growth has been in the last 150 years. We tripled in size our numbers over the last 60 years. It's an exponential growth curve. We have to deal with population. We have to take a look at population. Now, it used to be called population control, which was a rather violent term the way it was implemented, I believe. So I'd like to show this two-minute video first. What does population growth mean for climate change? In the things we do every day, each of us are changing the world's climate. We cook meals, travel, build homes, heat them, turn on the lights when the sun goes down. The problem is that as there are more and more of us, we're changing the climate faster and faster. The world's population has more than doubled in the last 50 years, from just over 3 billion people to just over 7 billion. By 2050, the UN predicts it will hit 9 billion. The cheapest and most effective way to curb climate change, most experts agree, is to get contraceptive services to the more than 220 million women around the world who want them, but can't currently access them. Experts say the cost of doing that would be about $4 billion, a tiny fraction of the cost of damage from climate-linked storms, which now runs into hundreds of billions of dollars around the world each year. You might think that cutting population growth is most important in places like Africa, where birth rates are higher than anywhere else in the world. The average woman in Nigeria, for instance, still will have about five children in her lifetime. In the United States, the average is now just two children. But in fact, it's curbing population in rich, developed countries that has the biggest influence on climate change. An average American produces about 17 tons of carbon dioxide a year. The average Nigerian produces a little over half a ton. That means that each additional child born in America will produce 28 times as many climate changing emissions each year as a child born in Nigeria. Many Nigerians aspire to the same lifestyle as Americans, and emissions there may not stay low. Look at countries like India and China, whose emissions are rising along with their incomes. But the rich should think before dismissing population growth as simply a problem of the poor. When it comes to curbing climate change, rich families may need to begin acting a little more like Nigerians, not by having bigger families, but by reducing the resources they use and the emissions they produce. This is a, uh, an issue for everyone, for all of us. It's like that old, um, the old adage that I was shown that when you point like this, the thumb points back at you. You're not, we're not talking about the other, that they have to consider population. We all have to consider population. Now, I'd like to explore the link between population and climate change in this session. And first, I want to introduce to many of you the term sexual and reproductive health and rights, which is the acronym SRHR. 
And I'd like to ask Nalini to please give us a little bit more context on the term SRHR. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, SRHR uh, is defined by the UN, the, the WHO, and the International Conference on Population and Development over 20 years ago, espouses two key concepts. And that includes the right to make decisions on reproduction and sexuality free from discrimination, coercion, and violence, and the right to the highest standard of sexual reproductive health. It means that people are able to have a responsible, satisfying, safe sex life, and they have the capacity and freedom to decide on when and how often they want to reproduce. But it is absolutely vital, and in the work that we do, we advocate for comprehensive, quality, universal, sexual reproductive health information and services to all. Thank you. So let's broaden that question now, now that we understand a bit more about SRHR as a term, as an acronym. And I'd like to ask the question of all three of our panelists, how, how are S SRHR population dynamics and climate change all linked? Raymond? Thank you, Stuart. Uh, the link between SRHR population dynamics and climate change is diverse in the sense that uh, it looks at one area issue to be the impact of high population on the pressure as it on natural on natural resources and the environment. Uh, for a case in point, uh, Uganda, where I come from, the population every year increased by three percent every year. That means in the next ten years it will have gone to fifty percent, to fifty uh, million. That is. So that means the population pressure inserted on the natural resources and the need for SRH uh, services and also SRH from the video, the contraceptives to impact the pressure is the linkage you need to that the high population will have pressure on the resources and therefore like deforestation issue to do with the wood and this impact on the natural resources. Therefore, the extinction, extinction of the natural resources and the impact on the pressure will lead into what you call climate change. And they, therefore, the impact the relationship and the linkage is in relation to the how we control the population in relation to impact and uh, access to SRH services, and most importantly, the family planning, which will have an impact on reducing the pressure inserted on the environment. Thank you. Can you add anything that to, uh, to that, uh, Zerian? My point is, uh the relationship between population, high population growth with climate change adaptation. Uh, when you talk about climate change adaptation, it means reducing vulnerability. We are trying to reduce vulnerability of our system, uh, vulnerability of uh, different parts of segments of community to res for resilience, or reducing every, every structures and systems and human elements. Uh, the, the, the kind of capability improvement for resilience, reduce the climate change impact to the systems. With this regard, popul high population dynamics is a vulnerability factor. It's a, a big vulnerability factor. It is obvious from, from uh, around 42 countries, nations, developing nations who have submitted their NAPA, almost 37 of them identified population growth as their main vulnerability factor for climate change. But none of them have included in their uh, adaptation plans, adaptation strategies, policies, and programs. So in terms of reducing vulnerability of communities, we have to include these key elements of population dynamics for areas who are very vulnerable for high population growth, like Africa and developing countries. Uh, with this regard, how then this population grows for high population dynamics is related with this RHR. When we talk about population growth, we are talking about right-based approach, not population control, as we, it, it, has to, at, it was before. So when we talk about right-based approach, we are talking about reproductive health and family planning. So what we are saying is, if we invest on family planning, somehow we will address a population issue, we will address its vulnerability, uh, vulnerabilities of communities, then at the same time, we can improve the resilience of communities who are very vulnerable to climate change. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. 
Now I'd like to uh, um, show you some of the beautiful graphics that Nalini pointed me to on uh, websites from Arrow. And um, I'll, as I step through them, Nalini, would you or any of you jump in on, on what they indicate? First, there's a series called The Five Indicators of Climate Change and their impact on women. Yes, I think it's important to understand that um, while the entire you know, population is at risk, women carry a higher burden. And you have to realize that um, there is disparities in terms of how urban women uh, you know, suffer the impact of climate change than the most vulnerable women at the climate front lines who are uh, in rural, remote, isolated areas. So what we have found in our work in Asia is that um, Due to water and food shortage, um, women are walking further to collect drinking water. And um, in some cases, they are you know, really vulnerable to sexual violence and harassment. Young girls have to drop out of school because they have to fetch water. And the burden on them uh, to maintain household duties is extremely high. As we talked a little bit earlier in the, in the last session, uh, agricultural livelihood crisis, it's undeniable. Um, but how does this impact women? Uh, in relation to sexual reproductive health and right, malnutrition has direct impact on women who bear children and go through the reproductive cycle. Um, in Asia, where I work, um, there is incidences of uh, early child and forced marriages. And what happens in the case when um, there is no information and services around contraception family planning for them to plan their families? We see young girls as early at the age of 14 to 18 having multiple pregnancies and births and they suffer from um, you know anemia chronic anemia they have uh, low weight ratios and um, are stunted but then the reproductive cycle does not stop for them and there is a continuum of miscarriages and morbidities and mortalities uh, related to uh, reproductive uh, cycle. Before I go on, the that term that I, we discussed, SRHR, the last R, I kept forgetting what it meant. And Nalini had to capitalize it in her last email to me, rights. And it just occurred to me that the rights is not necessarily the right to have more children, but it's the right of women to say, no, I've had enough children. You have to empower them to say, no. And yes, men, men don't always give women that choice. That's correct. And, and in the work that we have done over the last 20 years, we have found that if you talk to women, they will more often than less tell you that they, they did not want to have the five children they have. They would have been happy with two. But they do not have the means, the services, the information for them to plan their families. So that is one of the very big issues in relation to how what we are saying. Um, sea level rise, uh, as most island communities and countries are uh, facing at this particular time, um, with water contamination, with sea travel being uh, quite, you know, dangerous when women are pregnant, um, in search for services for maternal health, their lives are at risk. Calamities such as typhoons, cyclones are increasingly becoming much more devastating and are much more frequent. And I don't have to explain too much in relation to what happens to when houses are destroyed, farms are destroyed. Um, sometimes populations, including women, have no option except to migrate. And this as we know, uh, leads to urban poverty, um, leads to malnutrition, leads to increased violence against women, and leads to women not enjoying their full SRHR. We see, of course, as I mentioned earlier, um, the socially con uh, constructed gender roles for women um, exacerbates their conditions and situations during uh, when we see climate uh, change related events uh, in communities and we see that government responses in relation to say disaster uh, houses or you know uh, responses they do not accommodate the unique needs of women and women still face violence in those situations where they're supposed to be uh, kept safe yeah. yes so this is a story from um, Laos uh, where we see women who traditionally in uh, rural communities 
um, you know, have to travel longer distances now to find clean water, find food for themselves and the family. And this is what I was saying earlier, is that, you know, women, when you talk to them, they tell you that they would like to have had, you know, spaced and limited their births. Um, so access to sexual reproductive health service is important. This is a story from Orient and Mindoro in the Philippines. Uh, it's a coastal community of fisher folks, and they are seeing that warming waters have led to uh, diminishing fish stocks. And what, what happens when the men uh, in the villages have to move away and women become the head of households? Um, in Maldives, we see uh, seawater encroaching the you know, farmlands. Taro is not uh, you know, able to survive that. Um, what happens when pregnant women have to drink that contaminated water because, water because there is no other source of water? There is high likelihoods of miscarriages in that situation. In Nepal, um, women have to walk longer distances and are suffering from uh, conditions like uterine prolapse. Because they are pregnant, they still have to carry the water buckets and uh, basins, and you know they are extremely vulnerable um, to you know mortality and morbidities. In Pakistan, um, due to the floods we have seen um, and the lack of services available to women who are in these situations of disasters. Um, the decisions that they have to make on a daily basis as to where to stay, um, where to survive, where to get services from, um, you know, it, it leads to um, aspects of their life being dominated by what is happening to their environment. In Bangladesh, this is a story from Bangladesh, and we see that after she consumed um, unsafe drinking water, she um, had uh, delivered a child with disabilities. And um, after tests, it was found that it was linked to drinking contaminated water. Um, in Indonesia, uh, the destruction of biodiversity, which rural community women rely on, coupled with the impact of climate change, has led to uh, the sources of natural uh, food and herbs and medicines, uh, you know, they have disappeared. So not being able uh, to provide more nutrition and uh, to contribute to the health of, say, women who are pregnant or lactating, that is, you know, severely affected. And these are areas where, you know, there is not that much access of modern uh, medicine. The last question I'd like to uh, throw out to all three of our guests. Can we get you, Raymond, first to answer this question? What's the underlying message you want to leave us with about population? Thank you. As my colleagues mentioned, the linkage between population dynamics, uh, SRH and climate change is broader, basing on the population growth rate. <laughs> and our concern under the Population and Sustainable Development Alliance, where we are part uh, as a global alliance, we are saying you must look at instituted population and bring SRH and family planning on board. Uh, one of the areas we need to look at is the financing. Uh, last year at Paris, you know about adaptation fund was omitted from the agreements. We are saying adaptation is part and paramount, and therefore financing on for section productive health and rights, especially contraceptives, as you saw in the video. For example, we have come up with one one of the contraceptives, the condoms. Uh, this climate uh, climate condom can be an avenue of preventing the high population growth, which increases the population through the fertility. Therefore, people have unexpected pregnancies, uncontrolled uh, teenage pregnancies, issues to do with uh, reproduction. And therefore, we are saying governments must channel the 15 uh, uh, enough funding for contraception to reduce the population pressure and increasing the population, which impacts on the pressure on the environment. And therefore, in the long run, hindering and affecting the environment. Therefore leading climate change. Did you call it a climate condom? It's a climate condom. I love that. And therefore, a climate condom can be a bullet inducing the population. The seven, more than 7.4 billion uh, people on the planet can be hindered to reduce on the population pressure. Therefore, we advocate for climate uh, contraception and the financing be a priority in our discussion at, at COP22. 
and that is the bullet to reduce the pressure population pressure on the environment and therefore on the natural resources. And have you copyrighted that term? I'm going to go out and, and try to copyright the term. It's great. It'll be the next meme on the internet. Zerahun. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, my colleague already said what we, are, what we want to say. Uh, the first thing that we are promoting is population is a factor, so it has to be considered as an underlying factor for adaptation. That is one, one of the things that we would like to raise for developing nations, including Ethiopia, from where I come from. So population issues should be considered, especially high population growth should be a, a, a denominator factor. It has to be taken in that way. We have been struggling for several years now saying that we, we have to consider population in our development intervention, in climate change, uh, adaptation and mitigation intervention, all, all those things. But uh, we are on the way, but still we didn't succeed. Population is not considered as uh, a kind of uh, factors to contribute uh, to reduce climate change vulnerability. So that is one. Second, we have also to invest on family planning. We have to invest. We are saying that we have to invest in family planning. We are now planning, planning a lot of resources for adaptation. And if you look at the adaptation plans of every nation, uh, barely there is no inclusion of family planning within those adaptation plans. So we are saying that investment has to be directed to uh, uh, family planning within the adaptation uh, plans. Nalini, can you? Uh, we're, yes. we're running short on time, but yes, um, well, a very s um, short message. Uh, the, dis the discussion on population and climate change must not be on population size, but it needs to be around building healthy, happy, and resilient communities. Well, thank you very much. So population is the big, the big issue and the growing issue still. Thank you very much for coming. Special thanks I'd like to give to the Abibiman Foundation from Ghana, the Tsuchi, Buddhist Suchi Foundation, and the International Society for Ecological Economics. Again, my name is Stuart Scott. I'm the host of these Climate Matters TV shows, and we'll be having, I think, six of them next week. So please, if you enjoyed this one, do come back. There's my email address if you'd like to get in touch. And we've been coming to you from COP22 in Marrakesh. Thank you very much for coming. If you have any questions, you can meet with us afterwards. Thank you.